quote uh, Jeannie Mayo. She is a youth pastor. She's over 70 years old, and she still does youth ministry. I'm like, that's pretty amazing. But one thing that she says, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. What a great, uh, great remembrance that you, the, the, the people that influence you, the people that you're around, they're going to influence you. And, uh, and, and Jesus, you know, when we, when we look at the book of Acts, I love how, how Jesus, he starts off, you know, uh, where, the, you know, Luke, he, first thing he does is the first eight verses is, is, is Jesus there. Jesus is there before he ascends into heaven. And Jesus, he intro, introduces, uh, you know, the, 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 the calling and, and just, you know, just the, the power of the Holy Spirit and how, how, uh, you know, when, you know, the mission that, that God has for the church. And before he, he you know, he, he drops the mic at the ascension, you know, before Jesus goes up to heaven, here we see Jesus, he makes, an, he makes important commands that are, that are key for us as followers of Jesus to obey. As we follow Jesus, you know, we listen to Jesus and we listen to his heart. And the first, let's start out, we're going to go ahead and um, a little intro from the book of book of Acts, and uh, who wrote the book of Acts? Luke, right? I just said that, so, you know, I cheated. But I was going to put that in the blank on your form and I, or on your sheet, and I, I forgot to do that. I don't know why it didn't, it didn't print out, but that's okay. So Luke, he wrote the book of Acts, and, uh, you know, the book of Acts, it starts off where, uh, where, where the gospel of Luke leaves off. And so when we look at the book of Acts, the gospel of Luke is about the birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The book of Acts is the church fulfilling the purpose Jesus set out for the early church to do. The book of Acts is the church fulfilling the purpose, the purpose Jesus set out for the early church to do. And so Jesus' purpose is fulfilled under the promise of the Holy Spirit. It's fulfilled under the promise of the Holy Spirit, and this promise will, uh, you know, will come upon the apostles, on the 120 who are in the upper room, and, and so. But, but we're going to really just kind of focus on the first eight verses of Acts chapter one, and so if you got your Bibles, follow along with me. Who's got their Bibles? Come on, there we go, there we go. You get, you can, get, you can raise up your phone. Doesn't matter. That's all. Follow along with me. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. It says this. It says, the, uh, it says, The first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them, after his suffering many after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of god verse 4 and while staying with them he ordered them not to depart from jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father which he said you heard from me for john baptized with water but you will be baptized with the holy spirit not many days from now so when they, were, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Jesus, that you stuck around 40 days after your resurrection for a purpose, to share about the kingdom of God, to encourage the church, to, to establish the foundation of, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we are under today, that we are living in that place 
God, that you've called each and every one of us to be. Lord, I pray as we look at the book of Acts, God, you want us to be that healthy church. God, you want us to be that church that moves under the power of the Holy Spirit. God, we pray, Lord, that you would just encourage us, bless our time here, and speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Acts 1 is the bridge between Luke's gospel and the foundation of the church. It is a brief pause before Jesus released his disciples to spread the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Here we discover the purpose. The purpose, the power, and the promise Jesus gave his followers. And we are called, all of us, we are called to participate in his ongoing work. All of us, church. We are all to participate in his ongoing work. Jesus commands his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. To wait in Jerusalem until they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God. Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God. They thought, you know, it was to throw out the Romans and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. But, but their hope for Jesus was far too small. They were focused on temporary changes. Rather, God's, God's focus was an eternal kingdom. Was an eternal kingdom established through the church, empowered by the church. So first thing, you know, there's four truths that we need to really establish here as we dig into these first verses. We dig, we, it's really, we dig into Acts 1. First truth is that we see the authority of Jesus. We see the authority of Jesus. Jesus is the one who conquered sin and death. Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 or 18 and 19. The great commission, we know this. And Jesus came and said to them, "All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what we are called to do. Who gave us the authority? Jesus gave us the authority, right? Secondly, we see the promise of purpose. We see the promise of purpose. Jesus who has all authority, has given us a singular and clear purpose. What is that? To be his witness. To be his witnesses throughout wherever we go, whatever we do, that we are witnesses of Jesus. We are witnesses of that life change that Jesus has brought on us. We are witnesses of the Holy Spirit flowing through us. And since Jesus has not left us alone, the third, the third truth is important. God has sent his Holy Spirit to us. God has sent his Holy Spirit to us. The Holy Spirit gives us the power we need to follow Jesus and the confidence we need to live by faith. God has given you his purpose, his presence, and the power you need to fulfill his calling on your life. And listen, the final truth is super important because listen, because we are living in God's greater story of grace. We are living in God's greater story of grace. All of us, we have different experiences. All of us are part of, you know, the, you know, God's greater plan. The book of Acts shows us how the church began in Jerusalem, spread through Judea and Samaria, and grew throughout the known world. We are, st we are still caught up in the story of the church. We are still presently caught up in the story of the church today as the gospel continues to reach new people, as the gospel continues to be spread throughout the world, church. We are going to take, you know, some time, and we're going to go through the book of Acts, and, you know, and I, I am, I'm, I'm not going to rush this. I feel like God really wants us to, to really look at this and kind of take some time here. So this is your first time here. Listen, you are at the first, first time. Time, first beginning stages of the series that we're going to be on for a while. 
this journey that we are going to be on for a while. Because, listen, because the model for a healthy church, the model for a spirit-led, fully set-apart church, a church living out God's purpose under his promised power, so that we can carry out Jesus' mission to our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and, and throughout the world, it's the book of Acts. I want to challenge you to read through this wonderful book. Let me tell you, in my devotional time, this book is on repeat. I repeat it over and over and over again because I tell you, every time I read it, every time I go through it, I, I'm, I, I get blessed. I get encouraged. I, I, I recognize and know that it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can be all God, all that God wants us to be. And so today we're going to just focus on just these last moments, these last, this last tidbit of time where Jesus is on earth before he ascends into heaven. So what did Jesus teach about? Why did Jesus stick around for 40 days? And what did Jesus command his followers to do after he left? What did Jesus teach about? During Jesus' post-resurrection experiences, the main, sub- the main subject Jesus taught about was the kingdom of God. Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. And, you know, in, in verse 3 it says he presented himself alive to them after, he su- after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was something Jesus consistently talked about throughout the Gospels. It was the theme that Jesus, he continued the parables that he talked about. It was all about the kingdom of God. All about how God, how Jesus saw the kingdom of God. And I, th- I tell you, when we look at a kingdom, we see things so differently than how Jesus sees a kingdom. It sees it, how he sees his kingdom. And when Jesus came to earth, he brought God's kingdom. But it was not an earthly kingdom. The promised kingdom is present now only in part. His kingdom began in the hearts of his followers. And when Christ's return to heaven, God's kingdom remained in the hearts of all the believers through the presence of the Holy Spirit. God promised that he would ultimately reign over all and bring about the end of all death and disease. Before that time, believers are to work to spread the kingdom of God across the world. What's interesting, the term kingdom, when the, when, the, when the term kingdom is addressed mostly throughout the book of Acts, it's used almost simultaneously with the gospel message. It's, it's almost simultaneously with the gospel message, the term kingdom. Note the change that occurred in the disciples' lives. Think about that. You know, think about Peter. When, when Peter, you know, in, in, the, uh, you know, in the Gospels, you look at Peter. Peter denied Jesus. You know, Peter, he, he, you know, he, he denied Jesus. He denied that he knew Jesus three times. And then you see the, the resurrected Lord, that Jesus came. And, you know, note the lives of the disciples and how they changed. At, at Jesus' death, they were scattered, they were disillusioned, and they were fearful. Seeing the resurrected Jesus, they were fearless. They were fearless. They risked everything to spread the good news about him around the world because they, were, they, rec- they, they saw the resurrected Jesus, but then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They faced imprisonment. They faced beatings. They faced rejection. They faced martyrism. Martyrdom. Yet they never compromised their mission. They never compromised their mission. These men would have risked their lives for something. You think they would risk it for something they knew was was a fraud? They knew that Jesus had raised from the dead. And the early church members, they were fired up. They were fired up with enthusiasm to tell other people it wasn't something that they kept within themselves. It was all about the kingdom of God. 
It was all about the gospel being proclaimed. Secondly, second question is, why did Jesus stick around for 40 days? These men, again, these men wouldn't have risked their lives for something that they knew was a fraud. They knew that Jesus had raised from the dead. How do they know that? Verse 3, it says, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering. Many proofs. They presented to him alive with many proofs. After his suffering, you know, after his suffering refers to the crucifixion. Jesus was crucified. They saw him crucified. They saw him dying on a cross. But Jesus conquered death, raised to life. In 40 days walked the earth. Christ himself gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And the word proof, it refers to a decisive evidence. Decisive evidence. Jesus' resurrection had not been a sleight of hand or an illusion. Jesus came in the flesh alive. Listen, and I know, we know that as a church. We sung about that. But I tell you, that is the foundation of the book of Acts. Without that, nothing, nothing is relevant. Nothing is solid. Nothing is real. If Jesus did not raise from the dead in the flesh, His proof was solid. His proof was visible. His proof was undeniable. And these proofs would become the heart and soul of the book of Acts. The heart and soul of the New Testament church. If Jesus had not truly risen from the dead, then nothing that proceeds from this point on, from the book of Acts throughout the New Testament, would ever make sense or ever bring life change. The reality that the resurrection of Jesus is the convincing proof Jesus firmly established. That's why he was there for 40 days because people, his followers, needed to see Jesus alive in the flesh. When you see this, it changes your life. Paul, he reinforced the importance of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 through 17. It says, in, and it, you know, I'm just going to not read the whole thing, but here we go. It says, and if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. If Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he, is, that, that he raised Christ, whom he, did not, whom he did not raise, if it is true, that the dead would not, the, the dead are not raised. Let me read that again. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ had been raised. And if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. The importance of the resurrection of the dead the importance of Jesus coming from the grave and showing himself undeniable proofs. Our faith, our freedom, our new life is all rooted in the reality that Jesus conquered death. And by conquering the grave, we can praise God. We can praise God for the undeniable proof Jesus already established that he has risen from the grave. Third, what did Jesus command his followers to do after he left? What did Jesus command his followers to do after he left? Verse 4 and 5, it says, And and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus said to stay in Jerusalem. 
Stay in Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of the Father. Jesus said to stay and to wait for the Holy Spirit to empower them to ju- in just a few days, in just a few days, and that happened just a few days afterwards on the day of Pentecost. When all the kingdom, you know, with all this kingdom talk and the power you know, that Jesus spoke about for the last 40 days, the disciples, they had to ask question. You know, because Jesus knew their country. Jesus knew their situation. Jesus knew the oppression that they were experiencing as a nation. And so they asked Jesus, Lord, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Because the the average Jew in G- of Jesus' day was looking forward to the great anticipation of the literal coming of the Messiah's earthly kingdom and with it the restoration of the fortunes of military might and the nation of Israel that they enjoyed under King David. So they were expecting that. They were looking forward to that. That's why the disciples, they asked that question. Then Jesus had certainly taught a great deal about the kingdom of God and his ministry, throughout his ministry with the disciples. The anticipation had been heightened when the master, when Jesus resurrected from the dead. They were fully anticipating and expecting Jesus to bring his kingdom on earth at that moment. But the kingdom was all about what Jesus spoke. Jesus said it's, it's a spiritual kingdom established in the hearts and lives of believers. It's where the Holy Spirit changes our hearts and God does the work through the resurrected Jesus In Luke chapter 17, verse 21, Jesus says, Nor will they say, Look here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Behind it was the earthly kingdom that Christ promised to institute his return. The disciples, they wanted to know Jesus' timeline. They wanted to know what was going to happen for the, you know, for the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Like other Jews, the disciples, they, they hated living under Roman authority. They hated the oppression that they were going through. They wanted Jesus to free Israel and become their king, but Jesus had a better plan. Jesus had a much better plan than they even thought or they even anticipated. Verse 7, it says, It is not for you to know the this, this times or seasons, but the Father has fixed by his own, that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Jesus is telling us not to get so distracted. He, we even have to have that reminder today. Don't get so distracted about what's going on in the world. Don't get so distracted. Don't be, don't be so caught up with fear. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and soundness of mind. God doesn't want us to live in fear of what's going on in the world. God wants us to live in his kingdom, to live in the kingdom of God. Because God's got a plan. God's timetable is already set. Don't worry. Don't get distracted. Simply trust. Trust that God has it all worked out. God has it all worked out for his glory and for his purpose and for his plan. Jesus says that I don't want anybody to perish, but I want all to come to repentance. I want all to encounter the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every single person. That's why as a church we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can live out the kingdom of God to a world that is in darkness, to a world that is in fear. That a world that is in chaos, who's looking for truth. Listen, we have the truth, and we have hope, and it's only found in the love of God. Remember that he is all wise. He is all good. He is all powerful. Even when things seem chaotic, God is in control. His perfect will ultimately will prevail. We have got to rest in him and trust in him. And then Jesus said that after you wait, before he ascended into heaven, Jesus said these last words, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, 
in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then he left. It's the last recorded statement of Christ on earth. Listen, if it's the last and most important statement that Jesus gave to us during his earthly ministry when he was completing the work as he ascended into heaven. You think we ought to listen? The Holy Spirit is, you know, is, is the major theme throughout the book of Luke and throughout the book of Acts. It is the major point of the, of the continuity between the life of Jesus and the ministry of the church. The life of Jesus, as we abide in Jesus, as we draw close to God, we need the Holy Spirit to work us. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit. We need a fresh move of the Holy Spirit in our church, church. There's so much oppression. There's so much hardship. There's so much hurt. There's so much bondage in our world today. Only the power of the Holy Spirit can break through the bondage that people are encountering in our present world. We don't wage war against flesh and blood, but we battle it spiritually. And we need to be in, but we need to be a church individually that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to go into our workplaces, to go into our neighborhoods, to talk to people about Jesus, to declare what God is doing in our life, that the gospel will be proclaimed, that the that the that the, that the message of Jesus loving us, paying the price for us, dying on a cross for us, and conquering death. Raising from the dead and filling us with his power and his presence. That's the good news. That's the gospel presented with clarity, presented as unto the Lord, presented under the power of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? I think it's interesting because Jesus. He says that, you know, it says that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit throughout his earthly ministry. You look at the temptation of Jesus. You know, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The same power that empowered Jesus throughout his earthly ministry is here to fill us. The Holy Spirit is not just some sub-God that we worship. The Holy Spirit is God in us. God in us. God is three persons in one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God became man in Jesus so that Jesus could die for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead to offer salvation to all people through spiritual renewal and rebirth. And then Jesus ascended into heaven. His physical presence left the earth. But the promise to send the Holy Spirit, His spiritual presence would still be among mankind. Luke 24, 49, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city, stay in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. And then the Holy Spirit first became available to all at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The Old Testament, listen, the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit empowered people for specific purposes, individuals, specific individuals for specific, for, for specific purposes. Now all believers have the power of the Holy Spirit available to them. Jesus had given them their mission and their purpose and the power by which they would they were going to accomplish that mission. Jesus then said, wait. He said, wait. He said, wait. And then he left. 
then he ascended into heaven. Jesus revealed his kingdom, offered the New Testament church undeniable proofs of his resurrection, and told his followers to wait for the promised power to fulfill their purpose. And I love in Acts chapter 9 through 11, it says, and then he said, that he said you know, and when he, when, he said, when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight, and they were gazing into heaven. As he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus whom was, who was taken from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The disciples, they were stunned. They were stunned. They were looking. They were, you know, Jesus' departure, you know, the two angels, they came and, and, you know, snapped them out, you know, into attention, (laughs) you know, because they were shocked. They were shocked seeing Jesus gone, you know, and, and they were reminded, they were reminded of the commission, the commission that Jesus laid out for them to do. It wasn't an earthly, it wasn't an earthly kingdom. It was a spiritual kingdom. And that God wants to do a work in us under the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, if you're unsure of what God wants you to do, don't wait around. Don't wait around for a sign from heaven. God has told you what to do. To wait. Wait on him. You are his witnesses. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Wait till you are clothed on high. That's why we cannot. It's not a one and done thing, church. It's not a one and done thing. We're going to talk about that next week. You know, after after Jesus ascended, what did the church do? We're going to talk about that next week. But I want to just kind of leave you, you know, that, you know, the mission that, that Jesus has for us, it's worth living for. It's worth living for. To be empowered by the Holy Spirit, to make disciples of all nations, it's worth living for. So the takeaway is this. Jesus wants us to have a clear understanding of his kingdom. Jesus wants us to have a clear understanding of his kingdom. I encourage you, again, read through the Gospels. How does Jesus talk about the kingdom of God? It's all about people. It's all about the lost. It's all about God finding us and and searching for us, and and we're found the lost. It's all about the kingdom of God. Jesus has such a different view of the kingdom than, than we want or we desire, than the world looks after. It's not about power. It's about surrendering our lives to Christ and saying, God, let not my will, but your will be done. God, move in me. Use me. Jesus wants us to have a clear understanding of his kingdom. Secondly, nobody likes to wait But God's timing cannot be hurried. God's timing cannot be hurried. It's not about praying a five-minute prayer and doing an outreach. It's about praying. It's about seeking the presence of God. It's about being filled with the Holy Spirit every single day. Because when we get in the presence of God, when we get filled with the Holy Spirit, God's going to use us not according to our program, not according to our desires, but on, that's what his desire is, to use us. God wants to use us for his glory. He wants to bless us. But listen, Nobody likes to wait, but God's timing cannot be hurried. Set aside that time for the Lord and say, God, I'm here. I'm here for you. I want to hear from you. I want to I I be empowered to fulfill your work because that goes to the third one. Third, God's promise. God's promises are always reliable so we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. God promises that gift just like he did in the book of Acts. He says, I have a gift. the Father has a gift for you. He has that same gift for us, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You know, maybe 
today, you know, we're just anxious. We want to do something, and I, I get that. Sometimes I feel anxious, and I want to, I want to get, I want to do, I want to do, I want to do, but sometimes we just need to take, we need, we need to take that deep breath and say, God, help me to hear from you before. I, I have nothing to give. <laughs> I have nothing to give. I could be so anxious and so caught up with the moment, but God, if I have nothing to give, how can I go? How can I go? God wants to use us. God wants to fill us with his power and his presence. That's the book of Acts, church. And Jesus lays the foundation for us. He lays it all out. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus came to fill us. Jesus came to fill his church with power. To clothe us with power. Oh, God, we need you. Lord, we need you. We need your Holy Spirit. Jesus, thank you for setting that stage. Thank you for talking about the kingdom of God. Lord, help me to have a good picture of what the kingdom of God is. And Lord, that only comes through spending time in your presence, spending time in your word, spending time just encouraging one another and and just talking about the things of God with one another. Lord, I pray, God, that we would do that. Lord, that, that that is of your kingdom. Because, Lord, you want no one to perish but all to come to repentance. Lord, you want us to walk this walk. It's, it's, a, it's a faith journey. It's a journey that we take step by step, day by day. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would just empower us as your church. God, as we just are beginning this journey, Lord, as we take the time, Lord, this week, Lord, help us, to, Lord, to take this, this seriously. But Lord, to take it, Lord, as if just a load is lifted off of us that it's not about us, but, Lord, it's about what you want to do in us. God, help that to bring freedom to us, Lord, as we wait on you. Lord, as we wait on you, as we depend on you, as we look to you. Father, thank you for seeing us, Lord, for seeing New Life Assembly of God. We're your church. This isn't my church. This is your church. And, Lord, I pray, God, that you would just just bless our time, Lord, throughout the week as we spend time with you, as we seek you, Lord. God, encourage us. Bless us. Lord, as we, Lord Jesus, as, as we see your word here, the waiting can be, can be tough. But, Lord, help us not to be impatient in the waiting because it's worth, it's worth it at the end. It's worth it at the end, God. Lord, I love you. Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Jesus, I thank you for giving us the privilege to be in your presence. All those who are heavy laden, all those who are worried, all those who are full of burdens and struggles, God, that our rest is only found in you, Jesus. And, Lord, as we wait on you, we're going to mount up with wings like eagles. We will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not grow faint because it's your Holy Spirit that empowers us to speak what you want to speak, to do what you want us to do, to lead how you want us to lead. God, I just thank you for your presence. Bless us. Speak to us. We thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Asbury College. Yeah. You know, and I I think uh, we can look at revival, and we can uh, think, boy, oh, boy, you know, I want to duplicate what they're doing. It's not about duplicating what they're doing. It's about being hungry for God. It's about being hungry for the presence of God. Church, are we hungry enough? 
for the presence of God. So I'm, I'm believing. Amen? If we're hungry, God will show up. If we're hungry, God will show up. We got the Spanish service to this afternoon, 2 o'clock. It's great to see, you know, just the people coming and uh, dedicating a baby ne- next week, right? Got a baby dedication. Oh, man. Hallelujah. So Tuesday nights, you guys are praying. Oh, Wednesdays we're praying. It's all about a hunger for God. It's all about just waiting on the Lord and saying, God, not me, not me, not me. Lord, it's what you want to do. It's all about stepping out and being led by the Holy Spirit. Church, that's what God wants for all of us. It doesn't take the pastor to do everything. It takes a church being filled with the Holy Spirit to do, to be of the kingdom work. God wants to, God, his plan is for us. Amen? To mobilize us and to use us wherever, wherever the lost are, to tell them about Jesus. Amen? Love you guys. Have a great week.